It's so good to see each of you. And uh, we are plying ahead in our study in the book of Amos. And if you would take your Bible and look with me to Amos chapter 5. And we're going to begin with verse 1. We're, we're, we're going to look at uh, verse, our chapter 5 this morning. It is a long chapter, but uh, it, this really is the kind of the central message of this book. Um, it, it's interesting in um, Old Testament writing and Semitic writings, um, ancient uh, Semitic writings, what they do is really different than Western um, in several ways, but the way that you, I imagine many of you have heard many a sermon, I have, and um, we, my dad, uh, who is a pastor, we, he'd make jokes that, uh, you know, a typical Southern Baptist sermon was three points in a poem, you know, and, and it'd be done at that, that sort of thing. Um, so <clears throat> we tend to, as Westerners, we tend to build to a climax at the end. And whatever point we're making, we make point one, point two, point three, and then so this. And you really see this in Paul. Paul writes, uh, um, of course, he was uh, Jewish, but he was trained in Greek and Greek studies and a very learned man in Western thought. And when you read the New Testament, especially Paul's writings, um, he does that. He'll say, I'm, he'll make his point, this is the case, and then he'll make points one, two, three, Three, this is the case, and then he'll end it. So there you have it. There's the, you know, there's my argument. And so he's very easy to follow. And that's kind of how we think and how we do things. Not so much in Semitic writing. What they do, it makes sense when you think about it. They will say whatever is the heart of the matter needs to be at the heart of it. In other words, the center. And so they will put their point right in the middle of things and then move from beginning to the middle and then from the um, middle again back down. And this passage we're looking at, especially in verses one through 17, actually do this in this passage. So I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit in this passage here because the main point in verses one through 17 are actually in verses eight and nine. Um, and then he, he starts repeating. And so uh, it's interesting because I talk to my students at seminary and I have a lot of preaching students and I'll say, what, uh, what are we, um, how are we going to preach this? Are you going to, um, for instance, in Isaiah, it does this and it talks about the servant of the Lord, which I believe is talking about Jesus. Somewhere in the middle, it, it talks about his being put to death and then it starts talking about him living again. And I'm like, um, but not after resurrection. It's, talk, it's going backwards, pointing back to the center. And so uh, it goes from uh, those his enemies to his suffering to his death, to, from his suffering to his enemies. And so I'm like, how are you going to do this if you have in the text Jesus dead in the middle? How are you going to come back and talk more about this? And so, you know, you have to make decisions of how you're going to deal with the text and deal with uh, people that don't think that way. And so there's really a mission field here, actually. I tell, you know, missionaries have to adapt, adapt to their culture. We often have to in ours as well. Um, so what we see here is really in the center. And in this book, nine chapters, it's this message in chapter 5, is the message of repentance. So he's been preaching judgment, and this is the one place in the book where he, he says something about, you can return back to me. And then what we're going to see after this is just more of, I'm gonna get you kinda, kinda stuff. And, and so uh, this is this one place in this book where, uh, in the middle, in, in the center, where we have this message. And so that's what we'll be um, looking at. And I, I said one through 17, I'm gonna take one through 17 and then we'll pick up with 18 um, through the end as, as we look at this um, um, passage, as we look at all of chapter five. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then um, we'll look at this this morning. Our Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for the joy it is to come together to 
be with other brothers and sisters in, in Christ and to study your word. And I pray that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, our minds to what you're saying to us and speaking to us and that we will embrace it, that we will apply it, that we will be faithful in sharing your good news with others to the glory of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that we will truly be the light that you called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the shows that uh, I uh, grew up watching, um, you couldn't be in my home and not um, have watched this show, and that is the Andy Griffith Show. And in fact, uh, my mom and my dad passed away, came and lived with us, and um, she had Andy Griffith on all the time. We made the mistake of getting her the entire series on DVD, and, and um, we, we got her earphones because she couldn't hear either, so the whole house heard Andy Griffith, and so I was like, I like Andy, but I can only take so much uh, of Andy uh, all the time, so we, we did enjoy the show, and I'm, I'm reminded, when I read this passage here, I'm reminded of an episode in Andy Griffith, um, and it really, the, the, the person that it, this episode centers around is Otis Campbell. Um, Otis was the town drunk, basically. And uh, in this episode, um, Otis uh, tells them that uh, he has a newly purchased automobile. And uh, Andy and Barney... Um, the, the sheriff and deputy, um, they are concerned because they didn't think Otis needed to be behind the wheel of a car. And so they were really not liking this. And uh, Otis, typically when he would get drunk, he had his own cell in the, in the sheriff's office there. So he would come in, open the door, go into his cell there and, and just sleep off his, his drunk. Well, as he was waking up, Andy and Barney decided to uh, sing a song, and uh, the song was a lament. It was grieving over Otis's death. And so he wakes up, and he thinks he's dreaming as he hears Barney and Andy talking about what a good person Otis was, and they're so sorry he had died, and and if he'd only not bought that car and, and driven that car, he'd be alive today. And, and so he thinks, Otis thinks he's dreaming all of this. And uh, he goes back to sleep, but then when he wakes up again, he remembers all of that and he says, I'm getting rid of that car. I'm not going to get. And so it served their purpose. Well, what we see in this passage is a lament that Amos is bringing forth over Israel. The only thing is Israel's not dead either. And yet he is grieving their death, even though they're still there. And the point is that because of their sin and because of God's judgment, he might as well sing this song of their death because it's sure. And even though they think they're alive and although they have all this um, prosperity and all of these fortifications to, to protect all the stuff that they have and protect themselves. And, and although they have all of their religious activities, they can look to and, and say, hey, look at how godly we are. Um, the message is you can look at all that you want to, but you're dead. And, and, and God says you're going to die, so it's as if you're already dead. It's, it's a done deal. This is going to happen. And so this is what we see in this uh, passage here. And uh, it, I'm sure it was really annoying to these people. Um, we said that Amos, uh, his name means burden, and, it may, and he was quite a burden to them. And his message to them, I'm sure, was very much a burden to them. And so he sings this or preaches this lament which is just really, again, grieving over the death of an individual or a group of people, it could be. And um, this is the message that is coming to them. 
Now, as we look, we're, we're going to take chapter 5 into two sections because it's really structured in two sections. And the first section here goes through verses 1 through 17. And this is where we see the lament. And uh, this is something that uh, I was talking about before. It, it's set up kind of an odd way. Um, but in Semitic writings, at least odd to us, not so odd to the Old Testament, um, they, they often write things in what we call um, in our, our studies at school a chiastic structure. Now, that's a big word, chiastic. What does that mean? Basically this, they'll make a point, and then they'll make a second point, and then they'll make like a third point, and then they'll come back, and whatever the second point was here, they'll come back to that second point, and then they'll come back to the first point. And so it starts this point, and then a new point, and then whatever the center point is, and then it'll come back to the second point and then repeat the first one again. And so that center point of the chiasm is the most important, and it is the central idea and what they're building to. So they build up to it, and then they come back um, away from it with that repetition. What we see here are this chiastic structure has three points building to the center, and then three points going backwards away from it in repetition. And so in verses one through three and verses 16 and 17, we see the, the message of lament. And then in verses four through six and 14 and 15, we see a call to seek the Lord. In fact, I want you to see this. Look at verse four. He says, for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me that you may live. And then go down to verse 14. He says, seek good and not evil. So you see there where he's coming back to that idea of seeking the Lord. And so we see that. And then in verse 7, he makes accusations of their injustice. And then in verses 10 through 13, he makes accusations of their judgment. And the real center of this is verses 8 and 9. And so we're going to work our way through this. But what I'm going to do is I'm not going to repeat all the way through, but I'm going to take each first point, either at the beginning and end and second and so on as we go through. So the first message here in this, <clears throat> in this passage is those who reject the Lord are dead. Those who reject the Lord are dead. And let's look at verses 1 through 3. Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge. That is, again, a, a funeral song. O house of Israel... She has fallen. <clears throat> she will not rise again. The virgin Israel, she lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left. And the one which goes forth a hundred strong will have ten left to the house of Israel. And if you want, look at verses 16 and 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord um, the Lord, there is wailing in all the plazas, in all the streets, they say, alas, alas. They also call the farmer to mourning and professional mourners to lamentation. And in all the vineyards, there is wailing because I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. And so again, those who reject the Lord are dead, fallen um, and no more to rise. And so this is the message that is coming. And the question is, why? Why this dirge? Why this message of death? Why has this happened? And it is interesting, if you noticed with me again, in um, verse 17, um, and in all the vineyards there's welling, notice the last line, because I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. This is something that we should be taking uh, a look at and paying attention to. Because where's another time the Lord himself passed through the midst of Israel? All the way back in Egypt when we have the Passover. That's exactly right. And you remember it, don't you? The Lord said that I'm going to come through and that I'm going to kill the firstborn, but you will be saved if what? If you put that blood on the doorpost, correct? And he sees the blood, he will pass through your midst. 
what is he saying here? He's saying, I'm gonna pass through your mist this time, but there's no blood on the posts. I'm coming for you. So he's using the language of Exodus, which they were very familiar with. See, they knew their scripture. They just, they just didn't obey it. You see, they, they knew it. And he's using language that they should have gotten the message from. And he's using the very language of what they look to as a wonderful thing when God passed through our mist and saved us. Now he's saying, I'm going to pass through your mist and I'm coming for you. You're the ones that I'm coming for. And so don't miss these plays on words here that are getting to the point that he's saying that I did this to them, now I'm doing it to you. And this is why there, there, there are these dirges. This is why there is wailing. This is why there is mourning. It is because I'm coming for you. You are the ones who are dead. And so that's the message here. But again, why? How has it come to this? One of the things that we see here is that it, it, it has come to this because they substituted religion for authentic devotion to God. And he mentions here, as we move on, look at verse five. He says, but do not resort to Bethel and do not come to Gilgal nor cross over Beersheba. What's significant about Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba? Well, Gilgal, I'm sorry, Bethel, um, was significant to Jacob as all these places were to Jacob. And of course, Jacob's name is changed to what? Israel. And so he is one of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so it is at Bethel where the, Jacob had his first encounter with the Lord. And it's at Bethel that God promised Jacob that the promise he made to Abraham and to Isaac to bless him and to make him a great nation, he reiterated those promises that he made. God reiterated these promises that he made to Abraham and to Isaac. He made it to Jacob here at Bethel. And so Bethel was significant to them because they're saying, we are Jacob, we are Israel. And God promised our forefather that he would look out for us, that we are his treasured possession. We are his people. So what can harm us? Nothing can harm us. We are good because God is the one who is our God, who has promised himself to us. And so this is the thing. And then Gilgal. Gilgal was significant to the people of Israel in particular because it was at Gilgal that the, the Lord spoke to Joshua and promised him victory as the people went forward into the promised land. Victory over whom? Victory over their enemies. And so Gilgal represented to Israel the rightful inheritance of the promised land. So what are their, what's their thinking? We will never lose this land. We will always be in this land because God promised Joshua that he would give us this land as our inheritance. And so this is what we are holding on to. And so they saw this as God's gonna be faithful to his promise to Israel and Israel will always have victory over its enemies no matter what because God told Joshua that this land would be our inheritance. And then Beersheba, again, Beersheba received this name because of the covenant that Abraham made with Abimelech. And it was at that time that it was said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. And we go on and it's at Beersheba, the Lord spoke to Isaac and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father, fear not. I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring my servant, uh, for my servant Abraham's sake. 
And then later to Jacob, he promised his presence with Israel. And so when they look to Bethel and Gilgal and Beersheba, these places represented to them promises that God made of his blessing to them of the land, of this is given to them from God as their inheritance, as God's presence with his people, that he would never forsake them or leave them, that everything would be well with them. And the problem is this, a couple problems. One is this though, they were selective in their Bible reading and in their memory. Because if you go to Deuteronomy, God makes it very clear in Deuteronomy that you will sin against me. And when you do, the land that I have given you, I will spew you out of it. And you will be dispersed into captivity, taken against your will into a foreign country because of your rebellion and your lack of faithfulness to me. Well, we don't, we don't see them going to places that remind them of that. They're going to the places that remind them of the things they want to remember and look to, and this is what they're holding on to. And they're very selective in this as, as they look at it. I think I mentioned to you last week, as a kid hearing Standing on the Promises, I never once thought of anything as I would sing that song, anything negative. I always thought of God's gonna always be with me. God's always gonna protect me. God's gonna look out for me. He's gonna provide for me. And these are the kind of things rolling through my head as I'm singing, standing on the promises of God. And yet, there are words in the scripture that says that God disciplines his children. And it also says in Galatians, for instance, and I have to use New Testament because just in case there's someone in here that thinks, well, the Old Testament's just for Israel and has nothing to do with us, which that would be wrong thinking. You ought to check out 2 Timothy 3. But anyhow, um, as, as we look at this in Galatians, um, the, the idea here is that um, be not deceived, God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And he's writing, Paul is writing to Christians at that point. And there are consequences for disobedience. But they didn't want to hold on to that. And quite frankly, I think most of us probably don't want to think in that way as, as well. I don't. I don't want to think that way. And I, I, I don't think I'm probably alone on that. And so they were very selective in the things they remembered from God's word. And so they went to these places to worship and it was always a reminder to them that God's on our side. God's with us no matter what. And it was all about them. And it never dawned on them that as they received the Lord's blessings in their lives, and that they should recognize their worship, their worship should be aimed at being a blessing to God and others. But it was all about receiving and not about the mandate that God gave to them because when God called Abraham, the very first words we have spoken to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses one through three, twice in those three verses, God emphatically says that I'm going to bless you and I'm gonna make your name great and I'm going to look out for you. For what reason? He says it twice, so that you will be a blessing to the nations. That God had chosen Abraham and his descendants, Israel, to be a blessing to the nations. And how to be a blessing to the nations? Well, then we can go to Genesis 18. And he makes it very clear, God does in Genesis 18, beginning with like verses 16 through 19, right there, 17, 18, and 19, more specifically, where he says that he has chosen Abraham to be a blessing to the nations through what? By being faithfully obedient to the Lord's commandments and teaching his children to do so as well but they were not faithful to the Lord's commandments. They were not faithful to their covenant that they had made with the Lord. And so they were thinking that it's all about what we have and what we get without recognizing the call of God upon them and the responsibility that was upon them 
to be the people of God. So not only did Israel substitute religion for devotion to God, as, as uh, can be done today, they also substituted rhetoric for reality. Um, look at verse 14. Seek good and not evil that you may live, and thus may the Lord of God be, Lord God of hosts be with you. Notice this last line, just as you have said. There you go. As they're, they're sinning against God, as they're rebellious against God, what is their mantra? God is with us. God is with us. I look back, I remember one of the, the wars that I've uh, lived to see um, in my lifetime, and I, I forget who these leaders were exactly, but I remember in the news, there were two nations fighting against each other, and both leaders, both leaders on both sides, you know what they were saying? God is with us. God is with us. And that means we're gonna win. We're gonna win because God is with us, you see. And it's interesting how people can say God is with us. Well, what God wants to hear, I believe, from Amos and other places in the scripture is that the truth would be that we're with God, that our devotion is to him, that it's about our commitment to him as his people. And yes, God is with his people, but he calls us to be with him. And that's where it breaks down quite often because God is always faithful. It, it, it's interesting to me how we as believers, and we should, we hang on to the truth that God is faithful. It would be a terrible thing if we couldn't hang on to that truth. But at the same time, why are we not as fervent about God's call upon us to be faithful to him. And that we would be so zealous, as much as we're zealous about remembering God is faithful to us, why aren't we not as zealous about wanting to make sure that we're as faithful to him as we can be? We're not God, I realize that. But to be faithful to him, and that that is our overriding concern. You see, it's kind of a default situation that God is faithful to us, isn't it? He's never gonna change. So, I mean, yes, we're happy and we rejoice in that. But the real issue is not whether or not God's faithful to us because he always is faithful. But the real question is, are we faithful? And have we be, been faithful to him? And are we a people that are marked by that? And that was the issue with them. They were counting on God's faithfulness. Yeah, God is faithful, but God is looking to us and calling us to be faithful. And that's his, his interest. That's what he's looking for. And so he, they, they say, well, God is with us. And, and you hear just a little bit of just kind of a, I don't know, snarkiness in this, as he says, just as you've said. God is with us just as you've said. Yeah, you've said it a lot, it appears, that God is with us, but the real issue is you're not seeking him. You're not the people that he's called you to be. And so we might say God is with us, just like they did. But the real question comes, are we with God? And are we committed to him? And are we truly the people of God that he's called us to be? And that's what the message was to them that day. And then another issue we see here is they practice injustice and, and they profited from others um, who they had taken advantage of. Um, they profited from others um, who were un unjust themselves and they were looking for every opportunity to take advantage of the needy, and the needy had no recourse. 
It's interesting when I have conversation with, conversations with believers about looking out for the needy and being concerned for those who cannot help themselves. This is almost always the case that it comes up. I ask the question, should we not be giving and generous to those in need? Here's always the answer. We need to be wise. We need to be prudent. We need to be careful. We can't just be giving to everybody. We can't, we, there are lazy people out there. We don't wanna take care of them. We don't wanna help them. I get it. But I look at the scriptures. There's two things that I keep raising. Did, did Jesus give his life for those who, and, and does God give to those who are helpless or does he give to those who can help themselves? He gives to the helpless and that would be you and me. He is given to the helpless. And also it's interesting as well that he gave his very son to the helpless. And we, we, we say, I, I heard a guy say, I'm not advocating that God helps those that help themselves. No, but we are advocating that we're only gonna help those who help themselves. And it, it, it is interesting if we are to be like Christ, should we be prudent? Yes. But here's what my concern is. When we talk about giving, the first, our default, first answer should be, yes, we need to be giving and we need to be generous and we need to help those who are in need, those who cannot help themselves. Second, we need to be prudent about how we go about that. But what it seems to be, we say prudence first, we just don't wanna help any, everybody and anybody and then, yeah, we'll help, we should help people. I don't know that that's what we see in Scripture. I think that our setting needs to be the setting of God that he's been with us, generous and helpful. And then God is wise, and so he's prudent in how he does. And, and he teaches us, us that in the Scripture. But I will tell you, I'm, you're hearing me, and I tell this to my students, you're hearing me talk to myself as much as I'm speaking to you. Because my default often is I wanna hold on to what I have until I make sure that I'm giving this in a way that I feel like it's going to be something I approve of. Or if not, I'm gonna be very upset about that. And the only thing I'm reminded of is this. Has God ever given to me when I have, how should I say it, just really thrown away what he's given to me? and not been the greatest steward with all that he's given to me. I'm sure none of you have been there, but I'll just say that about myself, that I've done that plenty of times. And um, so I just, uh, as, as I look at this, yes, we need to be prudent, but first we need to be generous and then see how we can prudently be generous and not the other way around where I'm, I, I, I'm not gonna give unless, unless it just has to be and it's gotta be the, no, 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 that's not, that's not our default setting. That's not God's default setting, you see. It's not God's way with us. And yeah, I've been burned sometimes. But I, the Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment. And I can live with being burned rather than having held tightly to my stuff when I, should have been giving. Because if you look at us with God, we could use that same lingo. God's been burned by us if we think about the investment that he's made in us at times. And yet, aren't you glad that he's giving and generous with us? And so it is something that he nails them for. Not only are we to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this is something that they were looking to take advantage of the weak and manipulate the courts 
and manipulate situations to oppress those who could not help themselves. And here's something else that we often do. Um, I have a friend that often, he always wants the best for me, but I'll tell Ann, he, he always wants the best for me, but it always seems the best for me is always what's best for him. <laughs> you ever been around someone like that before? It's like, this, this is, oh yeah, you need to do this. It'd be really good, good for you. And I'm thinking, I don't think it is. And I realized, but it would be really good for you, wouldn't it? I mean, I don't say that to him, but it's like, I think that's kind of what we've got working here. And um, some of us, we have the idea, if it's good for me, then it's good for everybody, right? It must be, because it's good for me. And the whole world, it revolves around TJ Betts, right? And so if it's good for me, it must be good for all of you. And um, we, we can have this approach as well. And uh, this is, it's not about self-interest. That's not giving. There's a difference in giving and investing. And the Bible talks a whole lot about investing and we need to be wise in our investments. But there's a difference. Investing, when you invest in something, what are you hoping for? You're hoping for a return, are you not? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's wise, that's prudent. But that's not giving. Giving is giving without any expectation of return. If you don't understand what that is, it's like having kids, okay? There you go, okay? For a lifetime, actually. Um, because they keep bringing on more little ones and then it just keeps going. Um, but seriously, that's giving. You don't expect anything back. We, uh, we had our grandkids over uh, a, a couple weeks ago. We still have toys around the house. And I said, how long are these things gonna be around here, out and about like this? Um, because there's always hope within that they're coming back any, any moment, and she's ready to go with that. And um, I hope for them to come at any moment too, but I give her a hard time with that. But you understand, we give a whole lot to them. We have no expectation of getting anything back from them. You understand that? And that's giving. But you know what? It's not just giving to that which pertains to us. Giving is giving, period and understanding that to be the case. And so this is an issue that, um, that they were doing as well. So those who reject the Lord are dead. The next thing we see in this passage that they need to get clear is that those who seek the Lord will live. And look at verses four through six again. We see here, for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me that you may live. But do not resort to Bethel, do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity and Bethel will come to trouble. Seek the Lord that you may live, or he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it will consume with none to quench it for Bethel. And then look at verses 14 and 15. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord of God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And so what is seeking the Lord to look like? What should that look like? Well, the Lord tells them to seek him and not empty religion. Again, we have this mention of going to these sacred places and doing all that they're doing um, at these sacred places. And they recognize God is with us. We're God's covenant people. All of this is about us. And um, they don't realize that that is empty religion um, when we're not seeking the Lord. I'm reminded of Jesus's words in Matthew 7, verses 15 through 23. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. 
A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Again, those who substitute religious activities for true devotion to God are in store for a great disappointment. And all such substitutes lead to captivity and death. That's his message. And notice he says here also, we, we see seek good and not evil, love good and hate evil. In 3 John 111, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. What does it mean to do good in Amos? Well, I think he says it here in verse 15. In verse, uh, chapter 5 here, he says, establish justice in the gate. Micah speaks of this in Micah 6, 8. He says, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. To do justice means to walk with God so much that his standards of right and wrong become our standards of right and wrong. To love kindness means that as a people who have received God's kindness, that we show kindness to others. As a people who have received God's mercy by not giving us what we deserve, that we are a people who show mercy to others. And to walk humbly with your God means his followers are to live lives marked by an unwavering loyalty and devotion to God focused upon loving him and pleasing him. That's, that's what it means to be good. And God's call for Israel was to seek him and live. All the ways that they were going for in their lives was heading them to, or leading them to disaster. So the question comes, what is the focus of our lives? Is it really to live unto Christ? As Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Is that who we are? That is what he's called us to be. It is also interesting. We live in a culture, and it, I, I'll blame my, my own um, generation for this. because this, I never heard any of this kind of stuff from my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation. But we've kind of worked it out in our, our minds it seems like in my generation and those that have, that have followed, that love means the absence of hate. When did that ever happen? That's, it's just not true. Love doesn't mean the absence of hate at all. You see, <clears throat> if, if Anne, for instance, and I said this before, I think, if she were to get cancer, I would hate that cancer. I would want that cancer destroyed. Anything that would harm her, whom I love, I hate what would harm her. I reject it, I want it removed. See, it's impossible to love God and not hate sin because sin is worse than any cancer because cancer may take away our physical lives, sin, takes away eternal life if we are, are not saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even when we sin as believers, as I've talked about and we see, we've seen in the passage, there's always loss with sin. Always loss, not the loss of eternal life, but loss of blessing, loss of fellowship, loss of, of an abundant life that 
that we've been saved unto. There's always loss with sin. And so for us to truly love God, it means we will hate sin. And it's an odd thing that we live in a culture that says, no, no, you're not to hate anything. Oh, oh, yes, we are. I don't care what the culture says. I see what the Bible says. And the people who love God, they hate sin. And you know where, what sin they hate the most? Their own sin. Their own sin. I will tell you this. It's a lot easier for me to hate your sin than it is to hate my sin. And yet it, true hatred of sin will begin with a hatred of our own sin. Why do we hate our sin? Because it is an offense to God. It is an offense to God who gave his son to die for our sin. It's an offense to our savior, Jesus Christ, who willingly laid down his life and submitted himself to all the junk that he went through on this earth, ultimately led to a cross, all the stuff he went through for us because of our sin. And then we take it, our sin as if, well, it's all under grace anyhow, it doesn't matter. Oh, really? It mattered to God and it still matters to God. It mattered to God so much that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and he loved us that much. How much can we express our love for him if we take for granted and see as very, our sin is a very small thing in light of the highest price that could ever be paid, the precious blood of Jesus Christ for our sin. It makes no, no sense. It makes no sense. And yet, it, 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 it's an amazing thing how we, like Paul deals with this, we wallow in this idea that, well, I'm saved by grace, so it, it really, God understands that I'm a sinner. Yeah, he understands that we're sinners so much that he died for us. And the fact that he paid such a price it would seem to me that as people who love him, want to honor him, reverence him, and live for him because of the great price that was paid for our sin. And not to take lightly our sin, but to realize how awful it is as a child of God who has been saved by grace through faith, why would I just overlook my sin when I recognize the true price that was paid for my sin. And so as, as these people, they, they ignore God and they don't look at what God had done for them. And they were ambivalent toward evil and sin. Whereas hatred, meaning we reject it completely. We want no part of it. We have turned our back on it. We do not want to sin. And um, it, it, it's interesting, you've heard this, I'm sure. I had my Arminian friends say, well, you believe that um, once you're saved and you believe that you're always saved, that you can just sin as much as you want. I'm reminded of my granddaddy, who uh, a guy said this to him and he said, no, uh, I don't say, I, I, I sin as much as I want you say, but really God has changed my want to, to where I don't want to sin anymore. You see, that's, that's the default position of a person that understands the price that was paid for our sin. That the Lord has changed, as my granddaddy said in his way, he has changed our want to. We have no desire to sin, and we reject it. And they did not. This is not where they were. And so the, 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 the heart of this in verses eight and nine, let's read this. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes um, 
deep darkness in the morning, he, who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them on, out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. And so those who ignore the Lord do so at their own peril. They do so at their own peril. And a couple of things he mentions here is he talks about the Pleiades and Orion and, and these constellations. What's his point here? What's God's point? God is the one who controls all of creation. He controls it all. As the creator, he controls all of it. And because of that, he has the right to do with it. Because he's the creator, he has the rights to it, to do with it whatever he pleases. And so he brings this up right in the middle of this saying, I have the right to do this as a creator. And another thing I think he's saying here is that he is all powerful. I have the ability to do this. These are not empty threats. This is the truth. This is what is going to happen. This dirge, this lament, this destruction that's going to come, I have the power to do this and I'm going to do it. It will happen. One of the things I take away from this passage before we get to the next section, actually three things I'll say here. One is this, people are not in control of their lives. God is. You think you're in control of your life? You're just really not. You, you, haven't come to, you just not, have not come to the truth of the matter yet. Um, I've seen people take care of themselves as best as anyone could take care of themselves. I have a dear friend who, who passed away. He was in the best shape of anyone I knew. He's a medical doctor. He was just in great shape. And he had a heart attack while he was out cycling. I'll tell you, it had a bad impact on me in this way, though. I thought, well, he, he's in great shape and took care of himself, and he died. Well, I, I don't even want to have to, I don't need to fool with it because there's no hope for me anyhow. I don't think that's the lesson God wanted me to learn, but I thought, well, um, he was in great shape. But the point is this, God is in control. God is in control, and it's not us. We can do what we do, and we should take care of ourselves as, as, as faithful stewards of what God has given us, but, but God is in control. And um, we, we need to understand that. Um, next, God, people are not in control of their possessions. God is. And that's, that's the point he's been here. All the stuff that you've got, I'm going to destroy it. I gave it to you. I'm going to take it away. Job got this, didn't he? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God's in control of our stuff. God is in control. And so people are not in control of their possessions. God is. And another thing that comes out of this is people are not in control of their eternities. God is. You cannot determine your eternity in and of yourself. It is but by the grace of God. It is by grace through faith in him and trusting in him alone for our salvation. Trusting in ourselves. I mean, we can't even guarantee our physical lives, much less our eternal, eternal lives. And so he is in control. And instead of being independent, Israel had been altogether dependent upon the Lord and they failed to recognize this. I wonder if that's true about any of us this morning. How many of us may think that we're independent of God and have failed and are failing to realize that everything we are and everything we have is really dependent upon him and it, it comes from him. And it reminds me, this passage reminds me of the words in 2 Chronicles 15, 2. Chronicler says, if you seek him, the Lord, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And um, you may say, well, the scripture says he will never forsake me or leave me. The idea here is that he is always with us. But he will teach us lessons of discipline as New Testament believers. And uh, we are kidding ourselves if we think not, um, if that to not be the case. Well, let's look at verses 18 through 27. And I just got three questions I think this passage has for us as, as we close out our time here, these last 15 minutes. But begin with verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. 
Why would you have the day of the Lord? Or why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and learned his hand, leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sikuth, your king, and Kiun, your star god, your images that you made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. I'm reminded of a um, incident uh, this happened years ago. We haven't watched this show in a long time, but um, when it first came out, American Idol, uh, kind of a, a singing contest. And uh, I remember one particular singer, um, they interviewed this young man just before they were gonna get the results. And he was like, like there's no way I'm not gonna go through to the next round. I mean, he was just positive that he, 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 he did it. He was gonna win it and he was all confident about this and uh, nothing um, went wrong, he thought, and everything was fine. He got up before them and he was out. He was out. And that's kind of like Israel. They're very confident. We're God's people. God has made a covenant with us. Everything's good, God is with us. We are in. And it raises three questions that I think that we need to look at ourselves. The first one is, does your future truly hold what you believe it holds? Because that's the question that comes for Israel. They were sure their future was bright. They were sure that they were right with God, so everything was gonna go well for them. And uh, the question comes, does your future truly hold what you believe it holds? And this is where, where it, it, it is interesting with Amos. Amos is perplexed how could you want the day of the Lord to come? In other words, the day of the Lord was going to be at least two things that they understood the day of the Lord would be. First of all, it would be the, the destruction of those who are enemies of God. God once and for all would put an end to his enemies, therefore the enemies of the people of God. And so uh, destroy, God will destroy his enemies. That's one with the day of the Lord. Two, that God will vindicate his own people saying you were right to put your trust in me and to, and, and to be my people. And so they're like, bring on the day of the Lord. We want that. We want our enemies destroyed and we wanna be vindicated that we alone are the people of God. And Amos says, why are you wanting this? Because you are not the people you think you are. You say you're the people of God haven't you got the message? You're not. You, you by, by your religious activities and by the fact that your ancestors were people of faith, you think you're people of faith, you think you're God's treasured possession, and you're not. It's gonna go terrible for you. I could imagine this. I, I think back of, of, of songs that I grew up with, I could hear them in Israel, he talks about their music. They could say, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be. Or in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful, beautiful shore. Or when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And Amos is perplexed because he says, you're not gonna be there. You say you're gonna be there. You think you're gonna be there. You're not gonna be there because your lives have given evidence of who you truly are. And you can sing all the songs you want and you can quote all the passages you want and you can go to all the, the, the sacred shrines and do all the worship services you want to and yet you are not 
God's people because you live lives contrary to the faith that truly is brought about and the change that is brought about for the people of God. And so you can do all the stuff you want to and you can sing all the songs you want to and yet they're nothing because you are truly not the people of God. John the Baptist dealt with this in Matthew 3, verses nine through 10. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I think I told you, I'm a sixth generation Southern Baptist minister. In fact, I don't even know how that works because I've looked at the years and that means, first of all, they were Southern Baptists before there's ever a Southern Baptist convention. I don't know how that works, one. And uh, two, um, it, it's just uh, un unbelievable that uh, that would be the case. And the issue is though, it really doesn't matter in one sense. It doesn't matter in this, and, and what is that one sense? It is that my faith in Christ must be my faith in Christ, and my life unto Christ is my life unto Christ, and no matter how godly my, my, my parents were, my grandparents were, and my great-grandparents, and so on, I'm glad they were, but I'm gonna stand before God, me, and not based on their faith, but I'm gonna give an account for me and who I am whether I'm in Christ or not, and so are you. It, 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 thank God for godly parents if God gave us godly parents and godly people in our lives. But the thing is, if they, if they did a really good job, they would have taught you and, and I was taught, it's you. You are gonna stand before God and you're gonna give an account for your life. And they were thinking, hey, we're good because we're children of Abraham. Or here's another thing. How many times have we heard this? Again, being a sixth generation Southern Baptist, I've heard this all the time. What, I've asked people, uh, do you know if you stand before God today that you, you would um, go to heaven? Or what would you say And if you stood before God? What would you say um, to get into heaven? And they'll say this. I, I was, went forward in an invitation and I signed the card and then I got baptized. I have to tell you something. I am very impressed by your baptistry here, by the way. Um, I've never seen any, I thought I've seen everything. I've never seen one like this before. I've always seen it up front there. So I think that's really cool actually. Um, Ann said, you didn't see this? This is what my third week here or fourth? I didn't even notice it there, but I think that's really cool. But anyhow, so. The deal is though, we can say we've done all these things and what? So what? That's it, so what? Because the scripture says, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And if we are in Christ, there will be the fruit of the spirit that is produced in our lives. There will be evidence of that. And that's why we see Jesus and others saying that you're gonna stand and I'm gonna stand and there'll be people there before God and said, didn't I do this for you? And didn't I do this for you? And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And so this is what they're counting on. They're counting on all the stuff that they did. And it's like Jesus in Mark chapter seven, verses six and seven. He said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. That was Jesus. As he speaks of people who were very fervent about their so-called worship of the Lord. So, they substituted religious activity for true worship. And again, look at verse 21, I hate. This is what God says to them, I hate. I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings, your grain offerings, I'll not accept them. Your peace offerings, your fat and animals, I'll not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. 
To the melody of your harps, I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever, ever flowing stream. Notice, I hate, this is what God says, I hate, I despise, I cannot stand, I will not accept, I will not listen. This is what he says to his people about all of their fancy pantsy religious activities. And I get it. You say, how do you get it? I'll tell you what I think of is this. Let's say it's our anniversary. This year we celebrated our 35th anniversary. And say I get Ann this, this wonderful gift as an anniversary present, very expensive. And I hand it to her and I say, this is a token and expression of my love for you. What I don't realize is that she knows that I'm in the middle of a, 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 an unfaithful relationship with another woman. And I'm giving her this saying, this is an expression of my love for you when she knows that I am being unfaithful and have been unfaithful to her for quite some time. How do you think she's receiving that gift from me? That's not, that's not a gift to her. That's a smack in her face because I'm saying one thing to her that's very extravagant to her when in truth what I'm doing is egregious and awful to her and that unfaithfulness. That is what God is saying to these people about their religious activities. You put on such a show for me when it's really for you. It's really about you. He says, I don't want any of your stuff because I know the truth of who you are and what's in your hearts. And that is what God is looking for. When we come to worship him, do we truly worship him? And that's the next question. Is your worship of the Lord truly worship of the Lord? Is this really the case? We need to ask ourselves this question. Are we truly worshiping the Lord? Or do we just go through the motions? Are we doing something to get something out of it? Is it truly worship? And they offer their burnt offerings, their grain offerings. It's amazing. Their burnt offering was supposed to represent complete devotion to God. It was completely burnt, which, which is to say consumed, saying that I've, I'm giving my whole life to you, God. And, and truly they weren't. And so they were doing all these things, symbolizing devotion and faithfulness, but they were not. They were not. And what they lacked was authenticity. And then finally, the last question that comes from all of this, is the Lord Jesus Christ truly your God? The Lord was not their God. So the question comes up to us today, is the Lord Jesus Christ truly our God? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And also in Matthew 27, or I'm sorry, Matthew 7, verses 21 through 27, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so it, again, all of these things that we do, what God is looking for is authenticity. What God is looking for is that when we sing songs to the Lord, that they are a reflection of what's in our hearts. When we pray to him, that it's a reflection of our hearts when we go to worship services, that it's truly because in our hearts, we are living seven days a week, a week in worship of him. I, I think about this. I uh, had a guy, I, 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 a guy come up to me and I was wearing a, a polo. They had a golf insignia on it, um, some golf company. And he came up to me and said, are you a golfer? 
And uh, I said, no, um, not really. Why do you ask? He said, well, I noticed your shirt. And I said, oh, I, I really like the clothes that golfers wear. So I wear those a lot, but I don't really golf. But I think they look good and they feel really good. So I like them. Well, we, we can do this with our religion. There are a lot of perks to coming to church, aren't there? We I mean, can get to be with a lot of good people, a lot of nice people here. And that's wonderful. And also, I mean, I heard one guy I know, he said, I've got a lot of business opportunities I can get when, when I go there. And it's good for our children as long as they don't go overboard with all this stuff, right? I mean, it's a good crowd. We, it, it's a selective crowd. It's better than what they, they might get elsewhere. And, and, you know, there's good music and it's kind of entertaining and you hear some good things and, and you walk away and think, man, I feel better about myself. This, is, this has been good. Maybe I should do this every week. And it's all about us and we put on the stuff, the clothes, but it's not really who we are. I can wear the golf clothes. I could even talk the golf talk if I wanted to. I could read up on it and get all that down. But it doesn't make a golfer out of me. No more than putting on all the stuff of the religious activities that we can in our day that doesn't make us like Christ. And it doesn't make us Christians, truly. That was their issue. And so the question comes to us, where are we in that? And so the message of Amos, some nearly 3,000 years ago, comes to us today with these same questions.